Hi, I'm Neil Kleiman, and it's my privilege today to be allowed to interview Dr. Ziad Ali, who's assistant, soon to be associate professor of medicine at Columbia University, who's an interventional cardiologist, who is well respected worldwide, and whom I've got to say is one of the smartest guys I've met. So, Ziad, it's really a privilege for me to welcome you to Texas. I know you've been here before, but uh, we're just wowed to have you here. So, um, Ziad, you gave us an amazing lecture on use of new technologies to perform PCI in an incredibly safe way by understanding the technologies, being creative, and using them to minimize or eliminate the use of radiographic contrast. And obviously the intent there is to diminish some of the complications that are contrast associated, most notably kidney failure. So it was an amazing lecture. We all learned an amazing amount of things. I would encourage anyone who's watching this video to get onto YouTube and take a look at that lecture. You, you'll be amazed at what you'll learn. But I'd like to ask you, th this is phenomenal stuff. How'd you get interested in it? So I've kind of been one of those kids who was always interested in figuring stuff out. And uh, I, I had a, my entrepreneurial spirit really uh, developed while I was at Stanford. And that was uh, an amazing opportunity where there was a biodesign program where fostering entrepreneurial Ship and inventorship was really fostered and encouraged. And one of the main things that was brought out there is A, to identify a need. Where is there problems? Where is there disease that needs to be identified? Rather than making a technology for a need, we need a need than a technology or a technique. And then uh, really harnessing different people's expertise in order to solve a problem. So for patients with contrast-induced nephropathy, the problem is contrast. We need contrast to perform an angiogram. And we need to, to look at what are the alternatives to coronary angiography that still answer the same questions that coronary angiography gives us. And that was whether or not we think there's a flow-limiting lesion, which we can now answer using coronary physiology, whether that's FFR or IFR or RFR, and whether or not we've expanded the stent and left any complications behind. And we can do that with intravascular ultrasound or optical coherence tomography. And so uh, my roles include the director of the angiographic core lab at Cardiovascular Research Foundation, the director of intravascular imaging and physiology at Columbia. And by fusing those two tech skill sets, I was able to develop some techniques where we can avoid the use of radiative contrast uh, largely and in, in many cases completely to eliminate the risk from contrast nephropathy in patients who are with particularly high risk. So chronic kidney disease stages four or five who are on the verge of dialysis. One of the questions that came up when we started this was, well, they're gonna be on dialysis in the next few months anyway, what's the difference? We have found a completely different finding. And I think that's critically important for us to understand. We so tell us about absolutely off dialysis long term. So uh, I have um, many patients who are now two or three years out and not on dialysis, even when their creatinines were in the three, four, even five range. So the predictability of progression of nephropathy or progression of the uh, kidney injury to dialysis is unpredictable. And so if we can do anything to prevent that, we're now finding that we can provide a long-term benefit. I wish I had the actual numbers for you, Neil, but we're putting together the data now. In fact, one of my fellows is working on that uh, to provide a one and two year clinical outcome data. I mentioned in the lecture as well as two earlier, one of the hardest parts about this is I can't find a control group. It's very hard to find people who um, are performing these procedures, number one, but then also keeping the data in an organized fashion. Well, unfortunately, in medicine, we don't like to talk about our failures very often or very publicly. Yeah. Why, why don't you tell me a little bit about your path to where you are, finding mentorship. You, you've done some very 
some very, very innovative things. Um, how did you, starting in your fellowship and uh, as a younger faculty member, uh, how did you find people to help you out? That, that's always a challenge for people who are starting. So, you know, I, I guess I was lucky in that um, I had the opposite problem. I had lots of people who wanted to help me. And I think that's mainly based on my personality. I think, you know, I just, I'm a regular guy. And so when you're just an ordinary guy, you, or you hang out with the rest of the crew and you start to make friendships and bonds. And when you're on rounds and you're normal and people start to appreciate it and they think he's a great guy uh, and you foster opportunities that way. So I had a very unique training. So uh, after I graduated, I actually started by becoming a surgeon. So I did three years of surgery. Well, no one's perfect. <laughs> but that was an amazing experience for me because I wanted to be a cardiac surgeon like my older brother. And I realized that after three years, the, A, the timing wasn't right um, because we had just developed drug eluting stents. And B, I found that the repetitive nature of the operation without significant variation really wasn't my thing. And so I took a break from my surgical training and said, I'm going to go and do a PhD. So I got a Wellcome Trust Fellowship and went and did my PhD in Oxford with uh, my mentor, Keith Channon, who really changed my career. He was an interventional cardiologist and vascular biologist, but really taught me to focus my energies on the molecular sides and on the vascular biology side, which I did for three years. And that was an amazing experience. We developed new techniques, new technologies, uh, new polymers, new stent designs, technologies to, to, to interrogate these. And that was where the entrepreneurial part kind of started. And then uh, after that, I decided to come across to the, uh, the Atlantic and come to the U.S. And I interviewed at a bunch of places, but having your uh, interview under palm trees at Stanford was pretty much the selling point. <laughs> when uh, you're coming from England and it's always raining. So, Jennifer, we're going to have to install some palm trees <laughs> at the Methodist Hospital. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Great. So, um, and then I, the Stanford culture uh, was just perfect for this. So, um, important mentors in my career, you and Ashley, who brought me from the U uh, UK to the US, Tom Cotermus was our division chief, Todd Brinton, who involved me in, in shockwave lithotripsy. Uh, so we've been uh, involved in that since day one, which has been an amazing experience. And then since that time, uh, very important mentors. Samin Sharma was my uh, interventional um, trainer. Uh, Anna Pornikini, who taught me how to be a good technical operator and reiterated to me time and time again that with all the degrees and all the skills and all that, nobody can take away your technical ability if you learn how to do this properly. Uh, and then at Columbia, Marty Leon is Marty Leon. I mean, there isn't a more selfless leader that's completely invested in his team that I've seen. Uh, working on Greg Stone in clinical trials has been one of the most amazing experience that I uh, can experience. Ori Ben Yehuda in clinical trials. And then our cath lab team is just fantastic. Ajay Kurtney, Dimitri Karmpadiotis, Jeff Moses works with me on an, uh, across the lab with me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Sushil Kodali for Taver. Uh, these guys are just, it's an incredible group. So I've been lucky all the way just to be surrounded by great people. So how do you manage to balance all these things that you do? You're in the lab, you are running clinical trials. Uh, as we discussed at dinner last night, you also have an outpatient clinic. You have obligations uh, to the Department of Medicine, and you're doing basic experiments in an experimental lab. How do you put those things together? How do you find time to do it? How do you make sure you're not getting spread too thin? So that's always difficult. And I'd say the major change, which has been the most positive one, is the birth of my daughter, which has made me uh, reevaluate my priorities, and, and she is number one. So she gets all the first attention. But uh, when it comes to work, um, 
I have dedicated time for research, which I try to keep dedicated. I do two days in the cath lab and one day of outpatient clinic. And uh, the time that I spend on research is protected. So I focus on making sure that I'm doing high quality research. And that time. is the university good about protecting, about honoring the protected time? Very much so, very much so. They keep their word and they actually value the research as much as they value the clinical care and so uh, are very careful. And so is uh, our, not only our division, but um, uh, the Department of Medicine is very clear on that. So they try to protect the time. That's been very useful uh, for time management. Listen, it's been, uh, again, an honor and a privilege to have you here to interview you. Um, do you have any closing words you'd like to share with us? So my closing words would be to say hello to my lovely wife, who was born at Methodist Hospital uh, and is very excited for me to be here. So I'm equally excited and very grateful for the invitation and uh, look forward to joining you guys again soon. Okay, great. Well, thank you.